Next up, we have. Hello. I know who you are. Just no, All right. It's Rick Royers from uh, Motor Communication, and he's going to be talking about the importance and how to of high availability. We've touched okay. a lot of my subjects already, so we're going to see. Well, we can't. You took your presentation. No, I told you not to sit No, no, no. We <laughs> planned it actually. So we'll see where it can expand on it, where the information is going to go. Am I loud and clear in the back? Can everyone hear him? PowerPoint is staff work on here in different uh, just a heads up, everyone. There's coffee outside. You know, we obviously haven't run any breaks during uh, either of the days, um, but it's out there all the time. There's food out there all the time. Um, feel free to get out there, take a pee, get some coffee. But don't do it in the middle of Rick's presentation. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Coffee is important. Yeah. I availability and other things. The other things is uh, kind of all things we learned. Uh, over the past couple of years, first a uh, small bit about uh, who am I? Yeah, well, there's my picture and my name on my LinkedIn. Don't visit it. Oh, there I am. Now I have some feedback. Hello. That's a bit too high. Matter? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I keep talking. Now it's good. Cool. Uh, I'm a voice engineer from Mato. We have a lot of open six boxes, all kinds of different. Small boxes, big boxes, uh, they do a lot of things. I also manage the database cluster so that uh, I've, I've had a lot of the IO problems uh, with uh, the databases, which B just mentioned. Uh, also, I'm renovating a home currently, so I didn't have very much time to prepare my presentation, but will probably be fine. What time did we start? 10.40? You started at 10.40. Cool. You have 30 um, minutes. Well, a big announcement. Maybe some of you already saw it, but Motto has been acquired by Destiny, the Belgian. So now we're going to operate uh, across the borders. One of my colleagues from Destiny is also uh, also here. Our engineering department grew a lot. And overall, we got a lot of uh, people uh, with it, and I hope we can do lots of cool stuff, especially also with OpenSIPs and on, on the voice department. There's a lot of things to be done. Um, so what am I going to show? I'm going to go a little bit deeper upon the high availability with a virtual IP. Uh, P just mentioned about using CARP and VRP. We both tried these and we found these to be very slow. We're now using a combination of uh, Corsang and Pacemaker, which is very quick, which I can also uh, make a quick demo of. I want to show you a little bit about Grafana, which really fits in with the things that uh, Lorenzo told about yesterday. Maybe it's cool to use inside Homer. Um, you can really get a lot of inside information in OpenSIP, so I'm going to show you that. And some other things we've learned over the years, uh, some problems we have run into, some nice solutions we've built. Uh, I hope to show some code if it's going to be readable, we'll see. Um, so first up, CoreSync Pacemaker. Uh, it gives you high available IPs. It can also make whole kinds of clusters, smart clusters. We use it very simple, just one VIP which changes over. Um, yeah, well, why do you need high availability? Well, obviously, because your customers want an environment that's always up. Um, if an open shift box crashes for some reason, it happened in the past quite a few times because we had some very difficult issues to troubleshoot. Uh, you can fail over to the next box and it just keeps on running smoothly. And for, yeah, from the engineering perspective, it's really nice if you can uh, flick in a new version of your script in the morning, test drive it for an hour, gather some stats, switch back to the old one, or just keep it running if you want to. You, you're very flexible in putting scripts live and uh, testing out new features. About testing out new features, some things in your script which you're not sure about uh, if they're going to cause a big load. Um, I'll show you some that, something for that later. So core sync pacemaker, some concepts, quorum and stone. Uh, quorum is basically that you need to have uh, multiple uh, machines which are, yeah, it's basically a split brain situation to, to not have it. It's, imagine three machines on one side, two machines on the other, the three machines will win and they will keep quorum. 
we don't need quorum in a in a cluster of two machines because there is if one box leaves there's one left and he needs to be the master and stone if is uh, disabled that shoot the other node in the head you don't want to uh, have the cluster kill your boxes so just two machines the stack consists of some core thing also a picture, yeah. In the bottom you see two hosts. On top of that is the core sync layer which makes sure the hosts can talk to each other. They, it tells you a little bit about mem mem membership. And uh, also the quorum is um, calculated in there. Then there's pacemaker which makes sure everything is in the state you want it to be. You can make it as complex as you want it. The, the actual picture was a, little, a bit more complex. But I only show the public IP because the only thing we're actually managing with this is the public IP. Um, you could also do, you could also put open SIPs in it, uh, have it as a resource managed by Pacemaker. But then you lose a lot of flexibility because you can't uh, kill the services by yourself. You have to fiddle with the Pacemaker process. And on a live cluster, when you're upgrading or uh, working on the passive box, you don't want Pacemaker to intercept and manage the services for you and maybe even do a failover. So to um, still have an automatic failover and make Pacemaker aware of open SIPs, because that's where you want it to be. If your open SIPs process leaves, hangs, or something happens with it, you want it to fail over, you want it to go to the next box. So what did we do? We actually created a tripwire. So it monitors the open SIPs box in the in the back. Uh, something happens, processes leave, hang, or it, it, it has a couple of triggers on which it works. Um, it will trigger a pacemaker failover, which has yeah, which re really gives a smooth experience to the end users. Um, yeah, I can show you a bit about a failover. We could do a failover in here. Just to show you how quick it is, I should have an environment up and running. What's on the screen? This is not duplicated, right? There we go. Now I have to let me duplicate. Now you can see what I'm seeing. Yep. So here we have two boxes <coughs> on which we split the log. They log a lot. Let's see, I also have a SIPI running which is currently paused. Let's unpause it. Um, it's spawning calls. The numbers are increasing. It's probably very hard to read, but there should be some data moving on the left side. Yeah, that is actually moving. Let's up the numbers a bit to make it a bit more exciting. A couple more calls in there. So this is now the active node, and this is the, on the right side. You will have the passive node. So what I'm now going to do, I'm going to quit this log, and I'm going to say on this node, zero node standby, which actually triggers an immediate failover because on the right side you see the log immediately moving. It's really quick. It's the quickest we've encountered. We've tried CARP and the VRIT, but the failover took a lot longer. So really, if you want to have an instantaneous failover, I really recommend Coruscant Pacemaker. Um, well, the stats, they're now increasing because, uh, but that's the next subject. We'll come to that. I'll pause Sippy again. Otherwise, my open steps box crashes. I just jam together a script to get all the counters moving. But actually, the buy isn't handled correctly at the moment. Um, before on some, uh, when I've tried it before, this failover, but tested a couple of times, you could see sometimes some retransmissions on a couple of messages, so the boxes are retransmitting, that didn't even happen this failover, so it was a very smooth failover. Back to the presentation. Okay, cool. Working. So the tripwire. The tripwire. I'm not going to show the tripwire because you can't really see what happens. If you're interested in knowing how it works, you can you can ask me and I'll uh, let show you the script or uh, explain how it works. Um, back to the next subject, Grafana. Um, it's amazing. Uh, you can put a lot of data in it. It's, it's it's to present your time series database. We use InfluxDB. 
uh, as a storage and a Grafana as a front end. Um, how do I get that out of OpenSips? Basically, I use the FIFO get this fix all. It gives you this dump of data and numbers which aren't really useful in its own. They're only useful if you start getting, gathering them every minute, every second, depending on your use case. Um, so you could also add uh, the statistics module in your OpenSIP script. And what it enables you is it enables you to uh, integrate counters within your script, which can be very handy to gather some specific data. How many times is this block of my script? How many times is it hit? When is it hit? Is it only hit during, during certain moments or on, on specific, when a specific customer is calling? You can gather really specific data, which I can give you some examples of, which we did in the past. Um, so the upper three rules of these, the load module, the mod parameter, obviously the configuration options, and then the update stat, that's what you can use in the script. Uh, just check it out, it's, it's really nice. So about Grafana, you can see it running just now. This is the one of my test environment. So we have really blocky lines because I... You can see here the dialogues going up. This is the two machines, the, the 75 and 85. These are the two uh, nodes in the HA cluster, in the Coruscant cluster, actually. <coughs> you can see the memory rising, rising because what is happening, as I told you, the buy isn't handled correctly. So we're going to look a couple of hours back yesterday. You can see this enormous spike. Let's zoom in on it. <coughs> well, what happened here? I uh, enabled SIPI and filled my open SIPs box with, with up to 20, 25 calls. And after two hours, exactly two hours after the start, they uh, start dying off because of the dialogue timeout, because they're all being locked in a dialogue. As you can see, this is the, also the dialogue table which is uh, being graphed, and it's coming from the get statistics from OpenSIPs. <coughs> it's uh, really nice to get an insight in your, in your OpenSIPs, also during issues if you have crashes, you can see what is happening, is the memory rising, do I get an enormous amount of transactions incoming, or yeah, a lot of things can be, can be the cause of issues. Um, yeah, you have some random stats that you can see. I will also show you an example of uh, what we used, uh, see the data is empty, I'll tell about this, these graphs later. The invite counter, this is an example of the, of the update stat which uh, I showed you just now in the presentation. It's uh, on a specific open SIPs box and it actually counts the incoming invites according to the outgoing invites. It's an incoming box uh, with an asterisk which dials out again. How many invites hit it? How many invites get out of there? And you can see that uh, there's more in invites incoming than outgoing, which is to be expected as some are not authorized or have any reasons that they don't get uh, sent out. Just looks good, really nice to work with, really easy to work with also. I can really recommend to use it. Back to the presentation. Yeah. So that's about Grafana. Um, yeah, for now, some integrations, some things that we did, some things I did. Um, in the meantime, I've got five years of OpenSIPs experience. It started out with an OpenSAR box, which needed to be upgraded to an OpenSIPs because no one knew how it worked at the moment. It was, yeah, it was being put there. So I um, took it upon me to convert it to OpenSIPs, which took a while to get a grasp of, but now I think we got it. Uh, one of the worst things we did in the beginning was that we didn't quite know about the initials and the trend and, and yeah, the initial. The initial is the most uh, important packet, basically. You have to pull some functions on it to make sure that everything flows neatly after it. We didn't know how to do it at the moment, so we had some problems with our hacks and buys, and we actually built queries to get them to their destinations. You can see the, the bit of script here. It's as blocking as can be, as soon as the database has any kind of hiccup uh, and the queries hang for a second, it's it's the query is right right around right around here. 
Luckily, this code isn't live anymore. We've eliminated uh, the query by now. We are uh, knowledgeable enough to do that. So, uh, but it, yeah, it was, it was a really fun project to build this. And um, yeah, some of the things that uh, this really imposed a big load on our database. And yeah, obviously, we also have our database in Grafana. And you could see a quite decent drop at the moment that uh, this went out. So, oh, I shouldn't have quit the presentation. So yeah, that's the I can buy queries. Don't ever do a query on your I can buy. It should just flow. If you don't look in your initials, it's somewhere the solution is always somewhere there. Um, following up, following up on P with the dialog module, we've uh, also tightly integrated the dialog module in uh, in our open SIPs and one of the most important boxes. Uh, we use it to count the dialogs per user, basically, so we can have an outbound dialog limit. We can limit the amount of calls someone places out. It's not yet distributed, so each box individually counts, but yeah, it's, it's good. I think now with the new clustering capabilities, we can definitely improve on this and uh, make it work even better, so it, it, it's the same across all the proxies. Um, I think I also have a big, yeah, I have a small piece of script for that to show you. The other thing that I want to show, um, I want to tell you about, is the, the SHV set. I think it's, I'm not sure about the module, uh, something CFG, says CFG, I think. It's a model you can, uh, module you can load into open sips. So what does it give you? It gives you the possibility to set um, variables from outside of your script. So your open SIPs is running, you really can't interact with it, you can interact with it and the script via the shv set command, which allows you to push variables. So an example of the, how we use the dialog, this is just an excerpt, this is not the actual full code. Uh, right in the top, rule one, you see if is shv dialog enabled, is this one. So I can manipulate the shv from outside the script. So I'm able to disable the whole block uh, from outside the script. And why did we do that? Because the dialog uh, it syncs to the database uh, asynchronously, it updates every 10, 20 minutes. Uh, seconds, not minutes. And we weren't sure how it was going to respond with the database, so I wanted a way to be able to turn it off, uh, to be non-dependent uh, on the database. And this was it. You can see it also on line 9. <coughs> and on line 9, I can actually disable um, the outbound call limit. So for example, it didn't work as intended, or calls got uh, declined unintentionally, I could have disabled this piece of logic with, yeah, by setting the SHV via the command line. I don't have to restart anything. Um, which lines are also interesting in this? Yeah, here we set some dialog profiles, which we use for several kinds of purposes. Um, so we use a get prof on line six and seven. We use a get profile size and a set set dialog profile. Then we push all the values into the dialog, which are also synced to database, so other tools can work with it. Uh, one of the examples uh, what we use it for is actually I also have this nice highlight. So these are the rules I was talking about. Um, I'll tap again, please. About five more minutes. Five more minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Benaki. Yeah. So, what we actually use these values for is this is our the front end we are using. And the uh, information I push from OpenSips is actually used. To, to draw all these lines, to gather all these data and present it. So we really, uh, really tightly integrated it. Presentation visible again? Yeah. Um, we built multiple LAN WAN bridges because some customers, they have their own environment and they want to break out to your environment. Yeah, how do you do that? You really need a box with RDP engine or RDP proxy. If it's multiple LANs, 
was a very fun integration. Um, on the top, you can actually see which RDP engine it should use. Uh, and in the bottom, that's that's quite, yeah, that's the only thing you have to do to basically make the LAN WAN bridge. If everything is correctly uh, configured, the RDP engine, the RDP proxy, in this case it was RDP engine, you can very easily bridge, uh, bridge between a LAN and a LAN. It's, uh, we, did, we built a lot of these boxes and they work pretty good. Um, let's see. Databases are much of friends. <coughs> what I told you just now, uh, the dialog module, we, uh, yeah, I, I, I was careful in implementing it because we just had a couple of issues with uh, database performance. So I wanted to be able, but what actually happens, yeah, here you have an example of a graph which, we, which I can also show you live. But this is during some database issues and yeah, you can see in Grafana the update failed. As a counter I included myself just to be sure that uh, everything works and here you can see a small window in which uh, some uh, database issues occurred. Oh yeah, I completely agree with uh, Pete, try to avoid your, um, yeah, your database operations to a minimum. The flat store, the DB text, we are now into using DB text a lot. It's, uh, it works very good, um, but just for static data, for provisioning and stuff like that. Um, Web RDC. Well, I'm not going to fit that within five minutes, I think. Mobile environment without bound registration. So an open SIPS which registers somewhere else, pretty difficult to do, <coughs> but it's possible. UAC registrant. You, you, you want to? <laughs> okay, I'll... I'll um, yeah, this is one I wanted to touch up on, the fraud detection hang-up script. Um, the dialogue information which is pushed to the database is being crawled upon. There's a lot of places we crawl upon for fraud detection. We don't actually use the OpenSIPS module. Um, and in the end, it uses all the data and it uses the dialogue, um, the FIFO command for ending dialogues on the on the open SIPs boxes. So when we detect fraud and action has to be undertaken, we end all the active calls uh, via the dialog module uh, database sync actually. So are there any questions for the last three minutes? <coughs> Two minutes? How much time left? Alex? One minute. One minute. One minute. Any questions? One second. It's the oblig obligatory cat tax. We're gonna have uh, just one question. <laughs> I uh, really like the Grafana part. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how you read from the statics module, modules and put in Infix DB with that one. How is it done? How is it done? Yes. Um, it's a script which yeah. basically yeah. crawls every 10 seconds. It requests the data from the from the command line via the FIFO command. Yeah, we can touch it. So I can show you the script after. It's quite simple. You just parse all the data every 10 seconds and store it into InfluxDB. 